profits and put them directly into roads. These are proprietary funds, and the money that comes in to those funds can only be used for the sewer. So it's rule. The state. State law. Let's go to the state. Yeah, let's go to, let's go to Arkansas. Yeah. So, so, you know, these, these, yeah. So these, you know, these are proprietary funds, but that's not a bad thing. This, you know, that, that, those funds can come in and we can put taxes on them. In, uh, in Laconer, they tax the heck out of it. And that's the biggest source of revenue to that city's general fund, you know, but our goal is to use those funds to help, you know, well, help stop the creeping up of the, the sewer rates. And, and if we can do that, you know, if we can stave off the two and three percent every year that we're supposed to, that's a win. But if we could also maybe even knock it down or use the money to, you know, to, to pay off some of the loans, and it won't happen in two years. These are like 40 year loans, but maybe it'll happen in 10. Well, we only, we only owe uh, all together a little over four million. It's under five million dollars that's left on all, on all three loans. Mm -hmm. So at $30,000 uh, a day, that's a pretty size, good sized chunk every month. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we probably could knock it down two or three years and get it out of there. Yeah. It's done. After that, are we saying that that money can only go to the uh, sewer? <coughs> because all of a sudden you're going to have a giant fund there and you can't touch it. Well, that's pretty sure. Pretty much. <laughs> And then we've got be some costs you have. Yeah, I mean there, there are there are costs. There's overhead costs that we're not even you know there's going to be ha there's going to have to be additional personnel. There's going to have to be I've equipment. Already, I've already said that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean yes, okay. If the, if there is and this is not going to happen. It is not going to be some giant windfall of money. But it can it can help us. Yeah, big time. But I mean okay, if a bunch of money falls out of the sky into the sewer fund, then it pays for then everybody's sewer is pretty cheap. You know. Well, the other the other side of that is it more than likely will be a good sized chunk for us mm -hmm. simply because if uh, you guys saw the news over the weekend, 9.6 uh, million gallons of uh, affluent being dumped into into the sound every day by lot because they don't have any place to put it. Yeah, and they're not they're trying to get out of taking uh, mm -hmm. any more of the septic. Yeah. No, this is a good this is it's a program that we all believe in. So where we're at is the engineers have been tasked or being tasked with putting together a site plan. And for us you know, to get ready to get a dewatering device in there, because it's got to be done step by step. But so we're probably looking at what, a year and a half before we can really start doing anything? I, if we're, yeah, if we're, if we're moving on it. <laughs> but but the, I mean, the dewatering device is not going to be cheap, and we're going to have to, we're gonna have to <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to, we can't just write a check for it. We're going to have to figure out. The best, you know, do we find finance it? Is there a bond that we go for, you know? And then is it? Do we want to take on more debt when we're already worried about debt, or is it? What kind, what kind of gamble is that? You know, you guys will have to figure, you know, kind of weigh the, you know, do the little risk risk analysis of it and see, you know, how we should take it. We'll do the homework and or he'll do the homework and <laughs> put together the proposal. But you know, it's you're right to be excited about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, once in a while, I'm right about something. Oh yeah, Troy and I had a big <laughs> meeting about it the other day, and you know, I, I've asked him for updates, and uh, you know, I I've told him that we want to see progress on it, and his you know, kind of his frustration is the the you know the engineer. He met with an alternative engineer out there a couple days ago, um, so. Yeah. Okay. In pat number three, was there anything else? Nope. Okay. In passing Senate House Bill 1403, the legislature has required cities to amend their BNO tax ordinance consistent with the 2019 revision of the model BNO tax ordinance. Uh, we're proposing Ordinance 906. This would amend China Municipal Code 6.60 to comply with the requirements of RCW 35.102.040 model ordinance mandatory provisions and RCW 104. 102-130 allocation and apportionment of income. Mr. Lord. So this is uh, housekeeping. Uh, it, it's here in the work session because we didn't want to spring it on you guys, although uh, it kind of was sprung on us. We have to do this so that the ordinance is effective 
on 1 January 2020, or we lose the ability to collect B&O taxes. Uh, but the bottom line here is that the state has a model ordinance. Uh, it is, the model ordinance is what our current ordinance is based upon. And the change language here is to accommodate uh, the payment of B&O taxes by those businesses that are not resident here in tonight or any other city. Uh, if you look at the language that's changed in there, it's all about uh, defining what, you know, additional definitions of what engaging in business means and uh, the rate that applies if you are a resident business in town or if you're a transient business in town. Uh, again, it's just housekeeping. Do we have any questions for the clerk treasurer regarding ordinance 906? Just one thing. Since we don't collect our own, wait a second, maybe I'm wrong. I think a business license. Yeah, we don't collect our own come, business license. Diana, you know, that's why I'm right. saying I'm wrong. Okay, never mind. Never heard you say that before. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's some type of early New Year's resolution. <laughs> <laughs> Threw you off guard there. Right? <laughs> Hold down there! <laughs> the administration wishes to revisit credit card convenience fees. While the city agreed to accept some of the costs of accepting credit cards, we currently pay about 60% of the cost. So this uh, this credit card, or, or you know, using cards online, this is a new service. We've been doing it for a while now, and now we've done a little deeper uh, dive into what that actually means and what our costs are. Uh, so we want to have a discussion now uh, with the council about what is appropriate for a convenience fee because right now uh, for the card service the city itself is bearing a tremendous amount of the cost so i'll ask uh, i'll ask clerk treasurer millard to brief us on it and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions uh, ladies and gentlemen in your packet uh, there's just a single spreadsheet and what we've done there is tracked all of the charges that both our customers pay and the city pays and you can see there when we first started out the city was absorbing most of the cost but uh, now that the service is being utilized by quite a large number of folks um, we're down in about the 60 percentile in other words, the city is footing about 60% of the cost of uh, being able to accommodate those credit card transactions. So we we're not we're not proffering any kind of solution right now. We want to you know we want to know uh, what your thoughts are, and then we could come back with uh, some proposal. But uh, I'm curious if you have any questions or thoughts or concerns about where this program is now. I guess my only question is, is uh, receive, receive some kind of benefit by having the service, I think. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's shown that we get more on-time payments or is there anything or less time to process the payments or anything like that. So I, I guess my question is, what benefits is the city utilizing for this? You said there's a large number of people paid through this. What other benefits are we well, some of our budget woes are due to the fact that we're not getting the late payments that we used to get from both water and sewer bills. So that's good for our citizens. However, yeah. we're also paying for the transaction. Yeah. Well, I know. I'm just trying to say there's some, I mean, when we started this, the thought was there's some savings in personnel time for processing, so we're being able to do other work. So there's a, there's a benefit to the district. It's hard to, to put a money dollar, a dollar figure on it. But there's some benefits. So all this money we're paying, there's, I believe there's some benefit we're seeing by paying this money. But I see what you're saying. Well, that, that, was the, that was the discussion that we had before we did this. And what I recall is, you know, the council uh, was fine with the city absorbing a certain amount of the cost. But we didn't say, we didn't know you know, we had put a limit. Yeah. So, so now what is, what's appropriate? Yeah. You know, so what, what, they, they were fine with the, with the cost. I wasn't. So you're saying, I'm looking at this spreadsheet, the city pays a total of $4,234 over, over this time period that you got here. And this, we've collected $2,893. So we're, 
and that's over one. Sixteen. Months. They paid four thousand dollars over sixteen months. <coughs> I. Anytime you accept credit cards, you're going to pay. You're going to pay. What is the fee? What is there a convenience fee currently? The, so the customer pays a percentage of the transaction as a convenience fee. The city is charged a simple transaction fee. It's a flat rate by the retail lockbox. The outfit that we contract with and then they charge us a flat $35 a month to provide the web presence and then the credit card issuers also charge the city um, various and sundry fees that are associated with the purchases made uh, by the customers using their credit cards and they vary uh, I cannot determine a pattern other than you know, the more the more people that use the cards, the more the city pays. But um, at the outset of last year, we raised the percentage being charged. So now the customer's putting a little bit more of the bill. So the customers are paying about 40% and the city's paying about 60%. And part of those cards are probably mileage cards or, uh, yeah. And, and those, points there's, there's, yeah, if they're getting points for it, they're, you're, you're paying more. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, the banks make their money off, off of us yeah. accepting them. So. That's right. So on average, the the sewer water bill, what does somebody have to pay? What's the fee on a credit card just to pay the water your sewer water? Uh, well, it's a function. Dollar number. It's a function of how much the bill I, is. I understand, but on average, what's the dollar number? Is it three dollars? Is it five bucks? Oh no, some some of them are in the thirteen dollar range. I mean, really? Well, again, if you, if, you, <laughs> if you're paying a large bill, you're going to be paying more. I mean, that's the best I can do. I I have. The backup documentation for the, these spreadsheets are all the individual transactions. I'll, I can ship that to you and you can analyze it. So I just, uh, see, over here, this is all very sterile, you know, 4,000 and 2,000 and so on and so forth. But when you get right down to it on a person to person basis, that's when you get to see what it really costs. So if we can have a per dollar average of what is actually being spent, percent? Is, is by 3%. Oh. 3% of the transaction, that's what their fee is. 3% of, of, of what, 150 bucks is what? I don't know. <laughs> it's Without dollars. a calculator, I'm fine. That's a dangerous, dangerous question. Yeah, it's more than 73 cents. Here's my thought. Split it 50-50, the customer's getting benefit, we're getting benefit. Probably equate to like a 0.25 percent increase. So that would be, um, in order to do that, that would be a change to the fee schedule. Um, that's, that's okay. We can do that. So okay, what we will do is we will bring the fee schedule to the next meeting, and we will propose uh, Councilmember Watterson's uh, change, and then you all can debate amongst yourselves whether that's adequate or whether that's too much or too little or whatever, and then we can adjust it from there. Does that sound fine? Okay, so I don't use my card down there because of the fees. Because the fees are more than the points that I get, so it, I lose. It's, it's a lose. Okay. No. And, and, and yeah, everybody different. <laughs> pennies. I just walk in with a bucket of pennies for Denise. And... Okay, uh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Now that brings us, what's that? Does that sound good? Okay. That brings us to the main event. Um, after having been presented with information against the development of the old powder works, or I, I, I'm not sure how to best put it, the, the, uh, that area over by uh, North Savannah, Council wishes to consider all sides of the issue. We've been asked for a resolution of support. We've been asked for a resolution uh, condemning 
Uh, so we want to give an opportunity for the public to discuss it with us, which we've had a couple times, but we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to present an argument and then the council will discuss amongst themselves. Uh, maybe the city will choose to do something, maybe the city won't. If that, that is a policy decision of the council, whatever they come up with, uh, the administration will execute and that's how we're going to do this. So I don't know who's all in the audience. I, I know that, you know, I'm sorry, I forget. Josh. Josh has been here a couple times and uh, and spoke very well. Uh, and then, I'm, are you? I am. You are what? <laughs> I'm here to talk for North Point. Okay. So good is, so I, I want to make sure it's fair. So, you know, I don't know, maybe we can have, if, 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 I don't know if all four of you want to speak or if you want to choose somebody to speak or how you want to do it, but we could maybe give uh, this gentleman five minutes and then give a representative from the other group five minutes, but if there's other people that want to talk and provide non-repetitive information after that, we could open it up for that. I just, you know, so, so it's fair to everybody. Does that sound okay? Sure. I don't know if, Amy, did you, did you have something prepared? I'm, I'm just here for just for giggles and having yeah. a good time. Okay, okay. As long as everybody gets an opportunity. So uh, uh, I was I was hoping more for just because we've heard from that side two different times, mm -hmm. and we had uninterrupted, uh, no questions except for me, and this side, the other side hasn't had until today their their chance. Uh, I think that he should have the same opportunity as uh, that side has had, where I don't think he's gonna have to come back twice, but he should have just his time, not five minutes and five minutes, just his time. Well, everybody, we're, all, we're gonna give everybody a chance to speak. Uh, he could have been here the other times that they were here too. Did you know about it? And they didn't know about it either. Nobody invited them those other times. They There's were just difference. members of the public that walked in. This is so right now, is. This, is, this is, we are making an arena for these guys to come in, give their points, they can do point, counterpoint, I don't care what they say, and then it'll be up to you guys to discuss yeah. it. it. But just, I, we cannot, we can't let this gentleman go up and then say, sorry, we've already heard from you. I, just, I don't think that's right, because we wanted to create a, like a venue to discuss this tonight. That's, the other nights, that's not they, what I asked. I asked just to hear from the other side. And we're gonna, we're gonna hear from him. But the other times, it wasn't, we weren't setting something up with the, I don't know what, if there's a formal name for your group. Friends well, we did, friend, Yeah, we didn't invite Josh the other times. Josh showed up and he and he gave us his, his speech and it was great. But because tonight we're saying, hey, the main event is, uh, you know, these two groups and, you know, because you guys are going to be debating it out, I I think it's great for you both to have it in your minds. It might is what we're trying to set up. Okay. I can't think of, I can't think of a fit more fair way to do it. Uh, who goes first? Uh, if we got a coin to flip, this is fun. <laughs> Sage, you got a coin? Oh, Pull yeah. it out. <laughs> but she came prepared. Steve, would you just let it go? Fine. Yeah, just to. He's never first spoken to the coin. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, we're going to flip the coin. <laughs> hey, you got it. Come on. <laughs> okay, Sage, stand down. <laughs> All right, please introduce yourself and then we'll give you. Is five minutes sufficient? I tell you, I want to get the five minute mark if I haven't finished. Let me ask for a couple more. Okay, just right. if you could, yeah, I'm not, I'm going to cut you off at some point, though, because, okay. and I did that to Josh at the last meeting, so. All right, and. Go. Maybe to make this really easy, we could, Sharon and I, the friends of Rocky Perry, could just arm wrestle this out. <laughs> the winner of that. Sure, he's he still on his hands in the grass. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Dogs. <laughs> Yeah, make sure you're going to tie my right hand. There's a little, there's a little button on there. Yeah, it's not good. Okay. It's not good. good evening. My name is Steve Chamberlain. It was on. Oh. My name is Steve Chamberlain. I've been a uh, resident of Thurston County for gosh, well over 50 years now. Um, I actually grew up here in the South County area, so I'm very familiar with this area as well as the, the northern part. I uh, graduated from St. Martin's College green engineering and decided I wanted to become a consulting engineer for the rest of my life. So I, when I hear people talk about engineers, they can be frustrating to deal with. Hopefully I won't be tonight. But I am very familiar with the issues the city faces. I stood before several council members uh, in council meetings and county commissioner meetings over the years. 
and I know how it is to struggle with money issues, um, sewer issues, stormwater issues, water issues, and all the other things that you have to deal with. Now I'm going to focus simply on giving you some facts about a project uh, that you've all heard now from the Friends of Rocky Prairie a couple times uh, called North Point. Um, it's, it's in its early proposal stages, so there really is nothing that has happened yet except the applicants who are uh, from out of state, they're one of the largest industrial manufacturing um, uh, builders, developers in the nation currently. Uh, you can certainly look them up, they have their own website. Um, I was asked to provide you with some information about the project. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at that. Has anyone had a chance to look at it or not looked at it? Because I can shorten my comments if you have figured it out. I have no real history with North Point, except uh, for this last past year when they came into town. They are currently also doing a project in Lacey, in the Hawkesbury area. They are building a large warehousing facility for Home Depot. So that was their introduction into the state of Washington. Prior to this, they've, they've been doing a lot of work in about 20 other states, but not Washington. So they just recently moved in, and they, they, uh, they purchased some property in the Hawkesbury area. Uh, and are under construction now with a, a large warehouse facility for Home Depot. Uh, they were, were in contact with the Port of Tacoma um, a little over a year ago and uh, it had showed interest in purchasing a piece of property out here, what's been referred to as the old dynamite manufacturing facility. Has anyone been on the site or do you know where the site's at? Everybody knows where it's at? Okay, so you're familiar with the location. Um, they are under contract currently to purchase that. Now, they haven't bought it yet, but they are under contract. Uh, the Port of Tacoma uh, had um, uh, put that property for sale, and it too needs to get a return on its investment, so it put the property up in North Point, um, uh, signed for a contract to purchase it. Uh, that contract has not been executed, or I shouldn't say they haven't closed on the property, but the contract has been executed. In the process, uh, in order for, for North Point to have any kind of a project, uh, the property needed to have some uh, 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 rezoning done on it to amend the current zoning to allow their particular type of project to want. So an application was made to Thurston County earlier this year to simply get on the docket we were hoping to get on the, 20, the, the 2019 docket, but it appears that you know, that didn't happen. But we're, we're hoping to get on the 2020 docket, simply to ask the county commissioners to review their comp plan application. It's a comp plan amendment to modify the zoning that currently exists, the, the land use zoning that currently exists on the land. They made they an application for the county to amend that. That's all they've done. They haven't submitted any site plans. There's, there's no further application before the county commissioners at this point in time is simply to amend the compound. The site, is, as some of you may recall, has been referred to as a dual dynamite manufacturing facility. Uh, it, its past use was that. For years it was used uh, to, to manufacture munitions for the military. Uh, in the course of, of all of that, uh, <clears throat> the property has been tagged by the Department of Ecology as having contaminated both contaminated soils and groundwater. Um, they refer to this as a brownfield site. You know, familiar with that terminology, but it has been listed as a brownfield site. One of the reasons North Point was interested in this particular site is they one of their specialties is uh, rehabbing, reclaiming brownfield sites. And that's, you know, there's there's a whole host of things I could go on to, to talk about that. But they've done numerous of these reclamation projects all over the country. And so this particular project, because of its, its classification and the concern with the, with the contaminants that it has, uh, that was part of their reason for even looking at it. Secondly, its, it's uh, location uh, in reference to I-5, the I-5 corridor, um, is another selling point uh, in terms of the type of project that they're looking to do. How many people here use uh, online purchasing, buy things from Amazon? Anybody? One of the things that that, um, that we, we see has happened 
is that there's more and more people buying things online. All right, so the folks like Amazon, uh, just I'll use that as a case in point, are looking for warehousing facilities in certain locations along, in our case, the I-5 corridor. And they're doing this all over the countryside. So if, if you decide you're going to order something on, on Amazon today, uh, and tomorrow morning it shows up at your house, you're probably wondering how they did that. Well, the answer to that is that they've got warehousing facilities located along the I-5 corridor such that when, when an order is placed, uh, if that order is made, it, it is picked up and shipped out to your house within a very short period of time. Well, to do that, they need these warehousing facilities. Some of the clientele that, that, uh, that they service, the North Point Company Services, I'll just throw up a few of these names, I mentioned Home Depot is one, uh, Staples, Amazon, UPS, Kubota, Granger, uh, Caterpillar, um, Flex Steel, Patagonia, Chewy, Staples, Adidas, to name a few are the, the type of companies that they provide warehousing space for. How many people have been out to Fox Prairie in the last couple of years and seen what, what's going on out there? Can, okay, kind of an idea, those large warehouses, you know, that whole Fox Prairie area. Um, uh, is similar to the type of project that they'd be proposing here on this site. Um, <clears throat> I've heard all sorts of different rumors out there about what, what's being proposed and, and the type of traffic and what's happened to the, the, the site. And uh, you know, all I can say is some of that is, is, is just simply that it's rumors, it's not based on any facts. The letter that I provided you has in just about all areas of concern um, gave information on traffic impacts, gave information on light and glare, on sound. Um, these types of projects have to go through a fairly uh, long uh, and complicated review process. The county and the state both have rules, uh, thick books of rules and regulations that a, that a client or a project proponent like North Point has to go through. They have to submit detailed <coughs> studies, they have to submit engineering drawings, they have to go through a whole gamut of things just to get through the process. None of which has been started yet. Uh, assuming that they were to get a positive uh, uh, decision on amending the, the uh, uh, complex, <coughs> that process would start where they would go in and they provide a site plan, they would go in and, and continue further soils and water, uh, groundwater analysis. Uh, they, would, they would come up with preliminary water, sewer, uh, fire protection, a whole gamut of things that go along with a large project like this. They'd have to go through uh, their own engineering process and <coughs> their own approval process through uh, Thurston County. Um, and I don't believe that there's any requirements or any conditions that would require, you know, tonight you know, to make any decisions as it relates to this application because it's not within the city limits. But they certainly would love to have your support. Um, how, how long would this process you know, take? If everything goes um, <coughs> well, they may get some indication late in 2020 or early 2021 in terms of comp plan amendment. It would, it would probably take anywhere from a year to two years just to get through the approval process. No, one minute. To get through the approval process, um, to get anywhere near starting any kind of building project. Um, so we're still out a couple years before anything we can happen. Now, the site itself, is, 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 as I mentioned earlier, was, uh, has been listed as a brownfield site. Part of their uh, reclamation process is to cover the entire site with, with impervious air. Okay. So I'll cut you out there. We'll give, uh, we'll give a rep from the other group 10 minutes. And then we'll, if you want a couple minutes to rebut anything, and then we'll just open it up for questions. And we'll have about 15 minutes to do that. Sure. Uh, so you got until 7.15. Thank you. <laughs> Sharon Coots from Friends of Rocky Prairie. Um, just a few points. First of all, he talks about um, the, the land being a brownfield. It's gone through a complete DOE cleanup, what they call a MOTCA cleanup. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I never remember exactly what that stands for, Model Toxic something <laughs> clean up act, I think is what it stands for. And it's gone through that. Only nine percent of the pop of the uh, property was ever used for um, industrial purposes. 
and that's according to the Port of Tacoma itself. So this is not a huge area. It's also clearly not a desolate and destroyed place, or Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and JBLM wouldn't have been trying to buy it now for some 20 years so that they could restore it as prairie and use it for, to save the habitat that's so important there, as well as mitigation for some of the activities they have to do over in Fort Lewis with their endangered species. Um, there are some things in the letter that you received that Steve didn't actually touch on, but one thing he talked about was, was traffic and that, that had been addressed in here. And I don't know if you looked at it very carefully, but um, I was looking at it and trying to figure out exactly what they were saying about the traffic and that was so much less than what we said, and it wasn't. They ended up with a figure of about, um, well, 1,600 trucks a day, which is two trips. They got to come in, they got to go out. So that's 3,600. We said roughly 4,000. And I said that in a meeting with North Point's representatives from back east. And they both nodded, like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. That's about 4,000. So I wasn't really making that up. Um, that's one of those that we got from them. And then if you actually read that letter, and I forget what page it's on exactly, but it points out, um, let's see, oh, here it is on page, well, nine of the letter, or at least it's labeled nine at the bottom, although there's only really eight pages to the letter, so I don't quite understand that. But anyway, they then say calculations utilizing the Institute of Traffic Engineers will approximate much higher trip counts. So we, we, weren't, we weren't going out on much of a limb when we came up with 4,000, and that was sort of confirmed by them also. Um, some other things that they mention, and they, they tout rather resoundingly in their letter to you, is well, they're going to increase graduation rates. That's cool. I don't sure they can do that. That was impressive. But they're also going to raise the standard of living. They're going to cause all sorts of jobs here. Um, and they quote how many jobs per square feet. Yet an IKEA recently built in one of the centers that North Point was active in back, back in the Midwest now has uh, 1.5 million uh, square feet of warehouse, and it'll have 125 employees. That does not comport with the figures in this letter because they haven't taken into consideration what automation is doing to these places. Um, some of the other issues, let me just take a quick look here, if I can, be quick. Uh, um, well, first of all, they talk also about, uh, not first of all, again, they also talk about property values and that it's just a, a, a canard that somehow this will lower property values. But look at the other places around the country where this has happened and just ask your neighbors, what do they say? People have already come to us and saying we're putting our property up for sale unless you can guarantee us that North Point isn't coming down, be coming here because we don't want um, to lose all this money in the long term. Okay, I saw him signal two, two minutes there. Um, you have six minutes. Oh, okay. I thought I signed. Ten minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, I just as soon stop. I think he's mentioned, uh, I think we've mentioned most of this. Now, one more thing, the environmental concerns. This land sits on a critical, um, critical aquifer recharge area, Acara. Uh, it's critical. It, it's um, an incredible, important, incredibly important aquifer to the Black River watershed in the Chehalis Basin. Um, and the idea of, in, of paving over 472 acres, which is what when I sat down with them they showed me, and it's in their letter too, is phenomenal. I mean, the effect that will have on water and everything around there will be a disaster, including the drainage into Deep Lake, where if there are any spills, that's where the water goes, which is Millishevania State Park's lake. And in terms of noise and, um, and lights that he says there won't be because there are strict regulations, there are not strict regulations on this sort of thing right now. We have strict regulations on mines, gravel mines. Um, they have to stop at 7 p.m. These trucks do not have to stop at 7 p.m. They can just keep coming all night and all day, and I imagine they will, as will the trains that they're loading the traffic, the, the cargo onto. So it's a, it's a serious issue, and it's a serious problem. And even if all the claims they did make about jobs and their plans, and whether it's 3,600 trips a day or whether it's 6,000 new jobs, it's kind of irrelevant. This is just not the place for this sort of a, of a huge facility that looks like Hox Prairie. It's just not the right place next to a fish and wildlife preserve and a park, state park. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, before we open up for questions, do you have any follow-up 
Then I'll give you a what, minute? Okay, two minutes. <clears throat> Just to help Sharon with her math, it, it is the, the, the tra on the traffic side of things. The four thousand was used. It, that is way off. The, the trips that are included in this letter here are, are accurate, and that includes both um, both counts one way, coming in and going out. So it's not the four thousand; it's the sixteen hundred that the, the letter tries to permit. Um, one other point I want to want to make now for the questions um, from an economic development standpoint. I served 15 years on Thurston County Economic Development Council, uh, two of which was as its, as its, as its president, excuse me, Sharon's kind of short, so, <laughs> two of which uh, I terms as its president. One of the frustrations that I experienced in Thurston County was trying to find jobs, trying to bring jobs into this county. And over the years, the county has kind of shot themselves in the foot in that they've basically allowed the cities to uh, annex all the valuable property, all the retail type sales and all the other you know taxable type properties into the city limits. And in doing so they they have really lowered their ability to take and generate enough taxes just to pay for public services. And I, and I don't want to go into detail about the numbers. Um, but I will say this that this project and this location for this project, although it has some environmental concerns that I believe can be addressed, I do believe that that both an, uh, a warehousing project and the environmental can live together. They can they can find common ground. But the location of this site is perfect for this type of a development. And from a tax standpoint, I don't know how anyone can argue with with bringing in over eight hundred thousand dollars worth of taxable um, uh, income into Thurston County is a bad thing. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll just open it up for questions with the council. This is the work session, so no decisions can be made, but this is just going to be purely informative. They may have questions for you, you may have questions for them. We just, I'll, you know, unless we can have a hard time being civil, we can just keep this real simple. Uh, and then it would be during the actual meeting that a council member, this is not on the agenda, but a, a council member could make a motion to amend the agenda, place something on there, and anything could happen. Uh, what would likely happen is somebody would give direction to staff to draft something up or otherwise. And then we would come back to the next meeting and then there would be an actual debate on that. So with nothing further said, does council have any questions for our guests? Uh, I guess I just have more comments and you there you go. more comments than uh, questions. I read through the proposal and I appreciate it the information you gave us because I like to try to investigate both sides of an issue and I know there's differences, uh, different opinions and I value trying to, to find what I believe are the right answers so I appreciate uh, North Point giving us that information and I appreciate you presenting the information also. It's very difficult from that information I got to really understand all the impacts. I mean, I talk about employment, but it's hard to know because there's really no final proposal yet. Uh, what kind of jobs are those going to be? Are they all going to be part-time jobs? Are, what's, what is kind of the pay ranges you're going to see on those kind of things? Uh, as far as the impervious services, you know, you said it could be, you think you can work together with the environment, but I have a concern that we're paving over 400 and some acres of land. Uh, I think that is a concern. So I don't know how to uh, how I get to the point of knowing really a lot of those questions without having any final proposals on exactly what it's what it's going to be and those kind of things. So I'm concerned. I'm a little torn what to do as far as a council that we should say we just don't want this to happen at all, this rezoning to happen at all. Uh, or it sounds like it's going to be next year before they even do it. So I think we have a little bit of time at least to make a decision sounds like they're not going to be on the commission's agenda probably until next year, but it is pretty close. So it's a difficult situation because, you know, you want to support jobs, you want to try to do the right thing for the people of the community, but there's a lot, that's a big project and there's a lot of factors. And I used to work in Lacey at the fire department and saw the construction of all those warehouses out there and there's, there are impacts, there's, there's impacts to the fire department. Uh, even though they're sprinkler buildings, uh, that doesn't mean you can, can just say, oh, they're sprinkler, we don't need to have any protection or the personnel to deal with it because it's not the buildings themselves that burn, it's the contents inside of them that burn that you're concerned about. So it's, 
It's not even worried about it. You go out there for five rolled ankles a day. Yeah, you know, right? and, and the EMS calls. <laughs> yeah, so I want to try to do the right thing for our communities. So, even though it doesn't affect tonight, uh, our community is a bigger community. And it's going to take me a little bit to, to think through this and do a little research after getting the information from North Point. I would really like, I haven't had time to dig into more what's happening in other places besides my experience in Hawkesbury. And uh, so I wouldn't suggest that we do something in this meeting, but I would suggest give us some time to really, me, at least me, some time to dig into it and really look at the issues and try to make a very informed decision. I think I've been very vocal on not wanting big box stores in the vicinity of Tenino. And our school district, we, we only have 1,800 people in the town, but our school district encompasses 40,000 people. And many of them, many of them live out in that area. Um, I talked to several people that own out there, and they're just absolutely not for it. They'd like to just sell before anything ever happens, so they don't have to put up with it. Um, like I said, I've been very vocal about not wanting big warehouses and things in the vicinity of Tonino, so that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, I feel the same way. I can echo both of you guys' statements. I definitely do not want this out there. My mind's already made up. And seeing Hawks Prairie, there's empty warehouses out there right now. Yeah, there's other places that can, that, that can take this, but not, not our area, not, not out here in the world. I just, I, I just can't see it. Just Plus, that's my commute home. I'm not driving through there. Just yeah, it'll, relaxes it'll me to it. get home. That's how I go home, too, for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add something. The question I have, that maybe you can answer, maybe somebody can answer. You're talking about, you said, I think, in the paperwork, or maybe six to 6,000 6, employees, around 6,000 employees, uh, I believe was the number. And whether it's 6,000 full or part-time, to me it says a, number of permanent jobs on is 2,531, 2000. number of permanent jobs on 6.5 million square feet of development, 3,700. So 2,000 uh, of three thousand support sorry, jobs, 1,255, number of regional jobs, support jobs for 6.5 million, 1,870. My concern is, is where are they going to live? Where are they going to live? Are they going to have to, to drive to work? Where are they going to drive from? We're increasing the traffic. We're people getting in and out of the facilities. Uh, if they're, depending on what kind of wages they're making, do we have affordable housing for them? Uh, we're struggling with housing in this area right now as it is, so uh, that, that's another big question that I have for myself is what are these, where are these people going to go and live and are they going to be making enough money to even afford housing? That's that's a problem with just yes all of those um, cars. We have no regional transportation, no mass transit out here either. So all those people have to drive. Mm -hmm. Can I make one more comment? The the numbers that they gave, they said, and I quote, are based on historical averages across North Point's por portfolio of 70 million square feet of buildings. What they did not mention is that that 70 million square feet of portfolio includes retirement facilities, office buildings, and other facilities that have much higher job ratios than an intermodal facility. In our studies, intermodal facilities, uh, we looked at eight different intermodal facilities with data. The average jobs per acre was one third of a job per acre, so one job every three acres of facility. The best intermodal we found was 2.4 jobs per acre, and that was a 52 acre square uh, site, tiny site compared to this. Uh, typically, the bigger the facility, the newer the facility, the less jobs per acre in these facilities. So their numbers, and they stated in their program, are based on their entire portfolio. They're not based on the intermodal. If you ask them what the numbers are for their intermodals, I think you'll see a completely different number. Um, I, so, and I, just because, you know, when you say, well, there's no transit down here, there's no transit down here because there's nothing like this down here to need the transit. So, I mean, we, and when, you know, when Dave says, well, what's it do to the fire district? They don't have the personnel to respond to that. Well, you go to page seven and it says it represents another, you know, six hundred, $700,000 for the fire district, the school district, another 842000 So, you know, I'm not, I'm not in any way saying that we should favor anything but 
you also have to realize that kind of there is a that, you know there is a rise in the tide with all those things if you like that. If yeah. tax breaks. Well, and, well and, then there's that. Yeah, and, and that, that's another thing that kind of I I watched um, the um, state of Washington and, and through the legislature give the tax breaks to companies, big companies, and then that taxes are spread out to the people, and the people are paying more taxes because they have to have so much. Um, uh, Simpson Logging, for instance, they uh, they get a big tax break. Warehouser gets a big tax break. Logging oh, gets a big yeah. tax break. The state of Washington is famous for giving these tax breaks to big companies. So, you know, I... Yeah. Can, I, can I respond to that? If, if you don't want the tide to rise, I mean, you say, you say but... Uh, the, and then the other, there was something else that I heard that kind of, what was it, I was just thinking about it. I, oh, talking about, you know, the county, this is kind of my personal philosophy regarding the difference between county and a city. And you're saying, well, you know, the, the cities have gobbled up all the infrastructure, the cities have gobbled up all the commerce. Well, that's what they're supposed to do. All right, that, in my, and this is my personal opinion. Cities are set up to be cities. Counties are not set up to be county. And when a county tries to be a city, that's why it doesn't work. You know, so when a county is trying to provide, a, in my opinion, uh, when a county is trying to provide a bunch of services, like, you know, they, when they want to have a bunch of cops, they want to have a bunch of roads, they want to have, well, it's not going to work for them because they're not set up for that. That's, you know, cities are where you're supposed to have, you know, yeah, the infrastructure, the, infrastructure, the, the right. density, the, the commerce. If you put commerce out everywhere, then it just kind of, in my opinion, spreads out things the way they're not supposed to be. It's against the natural order, in my opinion. But yeah, that, that was just another thought that I had. All right, keep going. Who wanted to respond to? Please. <clears throat> well, first off, I'm not here to convince you um, to support North Point. And North Point doesn't need your support, first and foremost. <laughs> in terms of process, they would love to have it. Okay. They, they really would, but they don't need it. So I'm not here to convince you of that. I'm simply here to give you some facts and answer some questions you have. Whether they build out there or not, you know, that all comes down to whether they get an approval through the through the county. But I, I do want to address a couple of points that were made. First, this is not an intermodal project, so um, the definition that you're using, uh, sir, is this is not this is a warehouse type project. It's not an intermodal. There's a difference. So the information that's being bantered out out there is 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 is, is not not accurate. And again, I, until this thing gets through the site plan review process. There, there are going to be some ambiguities in terms of the information out there, but North Point, the largest in the country right now, are, are, are not trying to give false information out. They, they don't need to give false information. They're, this is accurate information based on the type of project they're proposing here. They're not trying to average things out to make it look better than it is or make it look worse. If anything, they're being very conservative about these numbers. That being said, North Point is not a company that's looking for any tax break from the state of Washington. It's not part of their proposal. They're not looking to. They're coming in here with outside money, north of three hundred million dollars to spend in Thurston County. Now, whether that filters down to the city of Tonino or not, I guess that remains to be seen. But three hundred million dollars worth of infrastructure uh, and, and, and buildings. Not even counting the the, inf the the stuff that's put inside these buildings, which could be another three hundred million dollars worth. So you could have north of a half of a billion dollars worth of money spent in Thurston County. Now, whether you want jobs down here or not, I guess that's up to you. The council can make their own decision. Um, I've always thought having jobs in a county was a good thing. Having been here long enough, though, I'm, I'm beginning to change my opinion because I, I I run into this all the time that people see jobs as being a bad thing. And if, you know, for, for, for all of those, those people who have to drive from here, and I was one of those, to commute from rural part of the county into Seattle or into Tacoma or even into Olympia, it does create traffic issues. There's no question about that. These guys aren't looking to, do, to, to create any, any traffic issues that they can't mitigate. And part of the process is, is to identify those traffic impacts and, and for the most part, most of the impacts are from I-5 down Maytown into this site. Those you know, truck traffic is not going anywhere else. It's simply I-5 into the site and out of the site. 
So, again, I just want to point that out. Paving it was, it was talked about. Like, like anyone who has to get a building permit in Thurston County, you've got to go through a process to show how you're dealing with stormwater, both roof runoff as well as pavement runoff. They too are being required to, to adhere to you know, all the requirements and the rules and regulations that have been established by DOE and, and, and Thurston County in dealing with stormwater. So any stormwater that enters the ground has already gone through a treatment process. Um, on the housing side, this thing wouldn't just pop over overnight. It, it would be built out over a period of time. So those those job opportunities that are there, you know, are going to begin with construction type jobs. So the local contractors would have an opportunity to work on that site. But the workers that would eventually work there most likely would look be buying homes, and that in itself drives the construction economy. So there would be need for housing, whether it's you know. You know, here in Tonino area or elsewhere throughout the county, it, they would drive the housing market. They would, they would, they would require that there be more homes built. And again, you know, that generates the tax base. Um, I think that was, you know, well look at the comments that I heard. Uh, on the job side, those, those 1,600 to 25, I think what the number is, 2,500 jobs, <coughs> permanent jobs, those are permanent jobs, and they do range from um, uh, on the low side of the 15 to 20 dollars an hour on up to the you know, 40 and 50 dollar an hour jobs and again the, in the information in the letter was was intended to be brief but at some point in time when they do get their application in there'll be more information provided in terms of more specifics about the job numbers as well as all the other impacts that we've talked about but you know, again I want to emphasize this is a project that's still in survey stages um, so it's a, it's a proposal that's out there. Whether it goes or it doesn't go, I guess remains to be seen. But I get, again, the purpose was to just give you some information. If you have any other list of questions, I'd Briefly, be happy to what answer. is the difference between an intermodal facility and a warehousing facility? <clears throat> you know, I, what, I, what I'll do just to make sure it's, that I'm clear on that, I'm going to send you the definition between the two. An intermodal uh, uh, type project has a variety of different transportation uh, boats coming in and out of it for a variety of different uses. This is a warehousing type project where they're going to primarily bring products in, they'll be warehoused right there, they'll be sorted, they'll then be you know, loaded back in trucks and you know, sent out to deliveries. Uh, there could be some light manufacturing, but there's no heavy manufacturing involved in this. They may be putting some parts and pieces together, but there's no heavy manufacturing involved in this. So it's primarily going to be truck and van traffic coming in and out of the site. Uh, there is a rail that runs through there, but for the most part, the type of project that they're building here doesn't does it need or require any heavy rail use. All right, thank you. Uh, I'd like to give the last minute to one of you, if you'd like. Real quick, Actually, I, I would like to say something. Okay. Great. Well, can we just real quickly intermodal? Watch the December twentieth, twenty eighteen Port of Tacoma meeting where these people bought, where North Point bought the property and explained that they're in partnership with BNSF Railroad and that they are planning for an inland port and intermodal center and that's what they uh, that's what they specialize in. They say is logistics centers and that's what they want to do. And just one uh, one other. Um, Thing, and that was when you said the traffic wouldn't go anywhere else. We saw how that worked during that accident just a month ago. We know that trucks take alternate routes when they want to take alternate routes, and it did not work out well for our county. Thank, Thank you. you. John, if you got a real quick. Yeah, real quick. I'm going to go back in history a little bit because I'm seeing it repeating over again. Many years ago, we had the opportunity to have intel right here in Thurston County. We had the schools, we had uh, the, the people, but we did not have the will to have jobs here in Thurston County, so we lost it to DuPont. Granted, that's all closed down now because they went out of business, but we, once a business opens, you, don't, you, you can't predict for 20 years that it's going to stay there. Once the business opens, we're, I'm just, we can redo this in the meeting, but I, I don't want to get off that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the work session. That was excellent. Uh, I'd like to call to order the uh, November 26, 2019, Tonino City Council meeting. Let the records show that all council members are present. Uh, please stand.
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. John and Payne made you cut me off like that. <laughs> I sure did. Yeah. Uh, we have an agenda needing approval. So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as presented. Uh, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? I was just looking through here. It says the second public hearing of proposed budget expenditures. Is that overall? I mean, I know we talked about revenues and did something twice, did two. Is that? Is that right, or is this the first public hearing on this is a, This is the second public hearing for the budget, but this is on expenditures. Oh, okay, I got you. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of the agenda as presented? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes, thank you. No problem. <laughs> this brings us to the minutes for the November 12th, 2019 Tenino City Council meeting. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. This brings us to the consent calendar. So moved. Payroll and EFTs in the amount of $27,822.25. Claims checks number 28699 through 28724 in the amount of $22,277.03 for a grand total of $50,099.28 with no new applications. Second. Has been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. We have no executive session. We have no presentations. Uh, is there anyone in the public that would like to provide public comment? Uh, if you would like to do so, please come forward. You'll be given three minutes. State your name and address, and we would love to listen to you. Going once, going twice. Moving along, thank you. That brings us to public hearing. Where is the public hearing procedure? Ah, oh, here we go. This is the second public hearing for the proposed 2020 budget. Uh, this is regarding expenditures. The public hearing, this public hearing is for public input and discussion of 2020 budget uh, expenditures portion. This public hearing will proceed in an orderly fashion and I would like, and if it's not, we got Seth in the back there, Officer Sharp. Uh, yep. I would like to ask your cooperation in the following procedure. Everyone present will be given an opportunity to be heard. The clerk will be recording what is said. Therefore, when you address the council, please begin by stating your name and address. Before hearing from the audience, I'm going to introduce Mr. John Millard, the city's clerk treasurer, to present information about this project. Good evening, Council, members of the audience. Tonight's subject uh, is the budget. We're supposed to be focusing on expenditures. Uh, generally speaking, we don't have any problems spending money. Um, what I would like to do is you may have noticed when we discussed revenues last meeting uh, that it was kind of difficult for us to do the balancing act. I started really looking hard at those numbers and I was scratching my head as to how we could have been so far off from our projections and the answer is that we really weren't. Um, the way the budget works is, you know, we budget to get funds and, and we have several very large projects and if we don't spend any money then we don't get reimbursed for those funds. So uh, even though we budgeted for projects, we didn't execute, so it's not that um, we were that far off on either the revenue or the expenditure predictions that we just didn't execute. Uh, we've got everything set. And there was a compounding problem. Uh, my challenge in trying to close out this fiscal year and begin 2020 budget is that our accounting software does not keep a Thank you, sir. running balance in each account. Uh, there is a routine that I run at the end of the year and only after running that routine in the program uh, will, it, will it produce a file that gives you your ending balance. Uh, so I discussed this with the folks at Bias and 
um, a rather tortured process uh, was used to carry forward the the 2018 ending balances have been certified by our state auditor's office and so those become the beginning balance for 2019. Knowing that, I could take those ending balances, add the actual revenues received for each account, subtract the actual expenditures for each account, and that gives me an estimated balance then to carry forward into 2020. And what we discovered is when you go to an audited source and, and start from that known point, we actually carried more over into 2019 than we had estimated, and we will carry even more over into 2020. For example, uh, I was basing our beginning balance for the general fund on right around $130,000, when in fact it will be more like $175,000. So that's good news uh, from the perspective of balancing the 2020 budget. Uh, and we will do that by preserving the cash flow, we will still preserve the cash flow, but we'll still have money in the general fund to account for you know, ebbs and flows of uh, revenues and expenditures. So it's a very safe, it's really actually a pretty conservative uh, way to go about it. Um, so, as, as you look at the 2020 budget position that now looks like the document you're used to seeing and not that big spreadsheet, uh, you can go through it and note that we are designing it so that we do not have any negative balance. The worst that will happen is there will be a zero balance at the end of 2020. The mayor and I talked about this a lot. We talked about septage receiving what we're hoping uh, and hope is only a course of action if you're a chaplain, I understand that, and I'm not a chaplain. But uh, I have every reason to believe that we will start our septage receiving operation uh, by at least June, and in so doing, we will increase the revenues and give ourselves uh, that much more cush at the end of 2020. So budgeting won't be as difficult in 2021. Depending on your questions, that, that's what I have for you. Hmm. So we, we have a balanced budget. It's not, you know, we're gonna we're gonna present the completed one next meeting. You've seen the expenditures, you're now seeing the you know the revenues being this is being presented to the public, not necessarily the council. Um, so if there's anyone in the public that would like to provide testimony regarding the revenue uh, proposal, please come forward and do so at this time. Council members, do you have any questions of the audience or staff? Okay. Uh, in the first budget we got for 2020, uh, law enforcement was like three hundred and seventy thousand dollars, approximately. I think okay. that was original. Now it's up to five hundred and twenty-five thousand no. dollars. Uh, I'm just curious. No. Yeah, that's what it said right here. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Thank you. Thanks. So the police department budget in 2019, um, our expenditures were $454,393 to date. So I, I don't know where the 300000 figure came from, but... Oh, I was just looking at this budget. Oh. You gave us a... That seems crazy. So, <laughs> this is a one. This uh, is one from the early, in the early in the yeah, yeah, process. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. I was just comparing. I just caught my eye. That's the only reason it caught my eye because it was three hundred and seventy thousand in there, and it's five hundred in here. I just was just wondering what. The, well, what the we've been going back and forth, and between uh, the mayor exercising his prerogatives and the department heads um, executing our instructions, uh, we've we've kind of reshaped this since our last meeting. And this knowing that 400,000. Yeah. The, the, okay. It was the law enforcement budget. Okay. I, I thought it was 370 or something. Yeah, well, 397. It's still good to get different between what that and what's in there. Um, 
Um, as far as expenditures go, there was a lot of stuff that we kind of initially wanted to uh, get in there. We talked about some additional positions. Uh, we talked about a, a part-time position in City Hall being created. We talked about a maintenance helper position being carried over uh, that was temporary, making that permanent. Uh, we also talked about a Parks and Rec uh, coordinator. Uh, after you know, looking at our revenue projections, we didn't feel that we had enough ongoing incoming revenue to be able to you know, really support new positions and, and be able to be comfortable saying that you know, we could you know, commit to any new positions in the future. So there are no new positions in this, in this budget. Uh, we did create some additional uh, um, stipend. stipend pays. So there is a detective stipend that is included in this position. There is also a stipend for a public works lead. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, for the operational employees, somebody to be paid as uh, kind of a, a second person or as a supervisor. And then also a, a, an array of uh, stipend pays for different uh, certifications within public works that were deemed uh, needed by the city. So we've, we've kind of, we've sent some people to classes and then uh, not, and they ended up not getting the certification. You know, and we're not real happy about that, but there's really no carrot or incentive to ensure that that happens. Uh, so we wanted to, we've been successful with the police department, with the FTO program, the uh, firearms instructor, DT instructor, having an extra hundred dollars a month when you have those certifications. The police department has, has done an excellent job ensuring that they have staff that are doing that. Uh, we feel that if we do that with public works, we'll be able to make sure we have a better trained and more robust staff. Uh, but other than that, we, you know, we, there's nothing, nothing real big and fancy in here. Did they fund, or did you fund the part-time park position? Is that funded or no? Nope. What we're gonna, what I, what I said to Troy was that we're gonna, you know, we, we don't, we're not comfortable, we wouldn't be comfortable putting in a, a full-time position right now and committing to somebody, but we will revisit that come May and see where we're at. I, I think you know if there's if there is some additional revenue that comes in from some of the commercial projects that have gone in, we might be able to support something like that. So while there's you know there's money, you know we, we talk about having a reserve balance. We have a healthy reserve, but you know without being able to bring it, ensure that we have the ongoing revenue, it would just chip away at that reserve and. I don't know if you know we're gonna yeah, see the revenue. Yeah, it'd be later. You know, you you win twenty grand in the lottery and you go sign up for a forty-year mortgage that you know you're not gonna be able to afford after a while. So it, I, I'm hoping that we can revisit it in the spring and see if we could propose to the council to bring back that uh, maintenance helper position because it is that is out of out of those three hopeful positions that we talked about. That's the most critical one. I I feel. We're still trying to figure out how we get a hundred thirty thousand dollar increase in law enforcement budget. What's uh, I'm trying to figure out. We didn't. There isn't. I don't know how you're. I don't know how you're getting that. Well, it's five hundred twenty-five right here, and it's four hundred thousand right here. I don't. Where Where do you see that? That's just in the packet. That you see it says part of the packet. On page thirty-three. Five twenty-five three zero. I don't know, maybe there's a wrong number. And I'm not against it if there's something I can understand what it is. Yeah, because when we were looking at it from years past, the, there was really no increases in the law enforcement budget outside of the needed changes in the in payroll. So I'm not sure what that's what I said. In the last year, it's four hundred thousand. Is it next? Is it? So, as part of the cost allocation scheme, there's eighty-seven thousand and some change in administration. 
operations 417, 115, crime prevention 1,000, uh, facilities 15, uh, 599, $250 for traffic safety school, total law enforcement $525,301. I'll look at it. I can talk to you between now and the next okay. minute. Okay. I'll, I'll have to go through and look at try to get more detail. It's, it's, yeah. hard, it's hard to look at this and see what, what's different from last year because it doesn't show last year's number on last year's numbers on this one. It, it, it is different than last year's. There's, there's no question about it. Last year was uh, almost 100,000 less. That's what I'm just trying to figure out what it is, what makes it so much more. Can't imagine salaries would be a very problem. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll look at it. We don't have to. Okay, with that said, I recommend uh, move acceptance of ordinance 908 as first reading. We're not doing that. This is just a public hearing. Okay. So it says on here. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we get confused about how the Council members, do you have any further questions of the audience or staff? If no, this public hearing, public testimony is now closed. So we do have some questions um, and we will work on that. Um, new business, Ordinance 908, this would adopt the city's 2020 municipal budget. This is the first reading. <clears throat> there would be a second reading. And uh, I understand that we do have questions that we will get answers to before uh, the final reading or adoption. So uh, we would like to ask that the council move to accept Ordinance 908 as a first reading. I just did. <laughs> <laughs> so moved. So I hear a second. It has been moved and seconded to adopt or to accept Ordinance 908 as a first reading. Is there any seconded. discussion? I Thank you. Okay, and I and I have those same questions too, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. But this is that. This so, you're not going to stick with what I have. There's there's some hidden that we're not reading, right? I mean, there's there's got to be because when we did the five year spreadsheet, when we went line by line, you know, there was no, you know, that yeah, there would be that would be a whole new position that would be that's a, thought, three new cars, you know, the, the cars we pay, you know, it's like 27000 a year for those. So, you know, there, there are some changes in how some of the, the costs were allocated. There are some things that, uh, where, you know, uh, Millard, John Millard went through and uh, figured, okay, well, you know, there, there is something that is used by everybody. Right, that's and, what maybe, you know, maybe, 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 yeah, maybe, previously, maybe, uh, it was used, you know, the thing that was used by every everybody, police department paid 5% of it, you know, like insurance. So police department in the past, I'm just making this up, paid 5% for our insurance bill, which is huge. However, the police department is, uh, you know, and this isn't an offense, is a, our big li a bit, one of our biggest liabilities. So, you know, we need to shift that to make sure that they're, you know, carrying their weight in their budget for insurance costs. So there, there are some things like that, but really that's that's about it. Other than there's some small stuff like, oh, we want some more ammunition. So okay, well you're getting two thousand dollars more this year for ammunition, and uh, we need a computer. You know, that, that was really about it. And stay out uh, of Tacoma for ammunition. Painting, yeah, <laughs> painting the the goat barn in the back, and that's in capital facilities. So that's not even in the law. So. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Ordinance 907. This would amend the 2019 budget in preparation for year end closeout. Move it. Second. It has been moved and seconded to accept Ordinance 907 as the first reading. Is there any discussion? This is Ordinance 907, an ordinance of the City of Tenino amending the budget for the fiscal year. Ending December 31st, 2019.
I'll read the first and the last. Whereas December 11, 2018, the City Council adopted Ordinance, ordinance nine, number 894, fixing the budget for the fiscal year of 2019, and uh, adopted by the City of Council of the City of Tonino, Washington, and approved by its mayor at the regularly scheduled open public meeting thereof this 10th day of December 2019. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? The motion passes. That brings us to number 11, Ordinance 906. This would amend to 9 Municipal Code 6.60 to comply with the requirements of RCW 35.102 and 040, the model ordinance mandatory provisions and RCW 104-102-130, allocation and apportionment of income. Having adopted the model code in 2013, Ordinance 906 would only amend those portions of Tonino Municipal cha Code Chapter 6.60 that are now at variance with the model ordinance. We are asking that you move to accept Ordinance 906 as a first reading. Uh, move move approval. Approval. Second. It has been moved and seconded to accept 906 as a first reading. We discussed this in the work session. Uh, if there is anyone that has any comments or questions, please go ahead and do so at this time. Hearing none, I'll go ahead. He's got a puzzled look on his face. We talked about this in the work oh, session. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. That brings us to reports. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. You want to do it? You want me to do it? Go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, as far as the city's end, I want to actually let them talk a little bit about what we're doing and the progress that we're making on the different buildings and all that kind of stuff, the grant monies that are coming in. And uh, the biggest news out of the chamber this time is there's a slate of officers that will be voted on at the next meeting because they need to adjust the bylaws to accept a fifth board member. Once that's done, the bylaws are accepted, the vote will be taken, and we'll have a, uh, we'll have a new uh, board for the Chamber of Commerce. Excellent. And Joyce Wall is going to step up to be the president again. Yeah. Oh, she is? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sucker. Yeah. Well, that's all right. We, we, we don't want to see that in good session. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's not bad. I mean, I was bummed that Tyler was yeah, Tom hanging Tom is, uh, is going to be on the board. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah I like that they're getting involved. Yeah, I, I, yeah we're kind of excited about mm -hmm. it. Too. Yeah, they're good people. Well, when is the vote? Uh, the next council, uh, the next chamber meeting. So Every Wednesday. Third Wednesday. Third Wednesday is the 18th, isn't it? I think. Okay. EDC, no, the BCB, no fire district. Can't give a report for them yet. No, yeah. Actually, a little bit. Uh, I believe I was, uh, Tina told me that they ordered their new tender, so it should be here soon. Excellent. Uh, museum. Uh, Gave the gave a tour to 15 kids. There's pictures of the kids up on the on a Facebook that. page, and that's pretty much it. That's all. We're, that's the status that we're in right now. Is just when people want tours during the winter time, either myself or one of the other members will go and open up the doors and show them around. Planning Commission, Facade Improvement Grant Review Committee. Nothing going on except uh, Elizabeth Shank is now ready to um, do some things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's ready. Yeah, she made a proposal. She's going to spend six thousand dollars on windows, and she's the reason that she hasn't done anything up to this point is she insists on using a, a contractor that she's used for other projects mm -hmm. that really does good work, and he is so busy that she but she's going to buy the the windows this year. And I think we've got what eleven hundred and twenty dollars left in the in the budget for the five thousand for two thousand nineteen, and so she can <coughs> put in for that, and then um, the work will begin around March, um, doing the work on the okay. building. So. Which building? Uh, next to the uh, landmark. Okay. Between the landmark and the Eagles. That was the violin shop. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a nice building. Yeah, it's a nice building. It's a shame that the violin shop's not here. Anderson's dance room. Yeah, they moved to New Mexico, you know. Yeah. 
Uh, Chief of Police is in Colorado, snowed in. He's like in 17 inches of snow right now. Oh, yeah, right. He, he called, is. He, he is. called me today. He says there's four feet of snow here, Linda, and I heard Becky in the background four saying... Four feet's a lot. That's you a know, lot. I, I heard Mindy say, it is not four feet. <laughs> <laughs> Becky sent me a message that said it was 17 inches. And they both sent me videos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Director of Public Works is at a pre-Thanksgiving dinner. City pre Attorney. Pre-Thanksgiving. Pre-Thanksgiving. Ah, that's what he said. Okay. Clerk Treasurer. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see my revised figures on the 2019 budget. We were actually executing pretty closely to the uh, model, uh, particularly if you look at the general fund only. Um, the numbers are skewed with respect to the entire budget because, again, we, we, we did not execute the, the quarry pool. We didn't execute the uh, uh, rental of City Hall yet. Well, so th those are expenses that probably will come full term next year along with receipt of the grant money for those. Um, so, so that's about it on the 2019 budget. The 2020 budget we beat to death. Um, there's been no change in our grants, uh, you know, no additions, no, no subtractions. Next month the quarterly reports are due. So uh, we've been spending at a low level on the renovation here at City Hall and on the Cory Pool, so we'll get those reimbursed uh, hopefully before the year's out, but if not, then we'll get it next year. So, um, The packet in front of you is the result of our 2017-18 audit. Uh, we had no findings, that means we don't have to respond in writing to anything. Uh, there's nothing being held over our heads. Uh, we remain on the uh, biannual uh, mo model. So our next audit will be in 2021. Uh, be yeah, if, if, in, in your packets there, I mean, it's, it's a lot of words, but the bottom line is uh, the two things that, that we need to address, uh, we are in the process of addressing, cost allocation on um, the financial side of the house, mostly for three employees, uh, two of them at City Hall and one at Public Works. And with respect to Public Works, uh, we have to accept what the timesheets that are provided to us say. We, we can't make up where they're spending their time. So uh, the only one that's susceptible to that is Troy. and because he's the department head, he's on salary, and he, you'll, uh, the n numbers in the budget reflect his time being allocated by his, his stated percentages. For example, he told us that he spends more time uh, helping with the water distribution system and helping with the sewer collection system uh, than he does in streets or that he does at the plant. So we made those adjustments. Uh, with respect to other items of cost allocation, as the mayor explained, this is why you're seeing more insurance being allocated to the police department. It's why you're seeing more insurance being allocated to the legislative branch, uh, more being allocated to the executive branch because of the liability inherent in the things that we do. Uh, if you take a look out there, every time you see a city being sued for a bad ordinance, that's the kind of liability that we're talking about uh, that we're insuring ourselves for w with respect to those functions. So, Can please. I quickly ask you, so we get an insurance bill with a lump sum for all the services, and we have to kind of figure out where that, where the risk is as far as that total bill. It's kind of crazy. They, they, they do help us out. Uh, they break it down into two chunks for us, liability and property. Uh, unfortunately for us, for example, the property is based on the buildings. Even though we insure our automobiles and our equipment, they're covered against loss. There's no way to tell from the bill that we get, you know, when they say property, we don't know how much of that, 
And the method they use to derive those, they, they don't want to release it. It's proprietary because that's one of our MSA selling points. They're able to uh, give smaller cities a, a, you know, a break. Um, so that's, that's what we did. Uh, and know, then the, the liability portion is, you are right. Yeah. But he has to, he has, I to, guess. You know, he has to develop a, a rationale and there's really got to be justified. And so, you know, he, so we put more, and then this time we put more in law enforcement because you felt that there was more. Like, and other things. And, and there's, there's, there's other, you know, there are other, like, uh, when you look at IT costs, yeah. you know, those have kind of been reapportioned, they've gone up, and then it's kind of been re well, who uses the most of this, who uses the most of that, so it's perfect. And some of that's pretty easy to do, like, yeah. you know, that's a great example, the new uh, managed network service contract. Uh, take the total dollar amount, divide it by the number of users we have, and bing, there's the charge. Uh, so some of that stuff is pretty easy, but... Uh, and the auditor's office isn't telling us what to do. They're say, they they give you the well, chance. The they give you enough rope to hang yourself. Yeah. yeah they, they're like, well, do it. Make sure you can justify it. And we're not, you know, and they even said that to us. But if it if it seems wonky, they're gonna call you. So I'm trying to get. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious how you figured that out. You know, like, like Montesano, it was like they had like our back. You know, we got a backup, and it was paid out of different. You know, Montesano had one that they were using for one fund. It was all paid out of another fund, and they got called on it. Yeah. And then other funds have to start paying each other back, and it. So, well, yeah. well, well, to a degree, it's it's kind of like Councilmember O'Callaghan's uh, you know, attempting to to allocate those costs out in that some, particularly in a small city like this, where we try to offer as many services as we can, we wind up balancing the budget on the backs of the proprietary accounts. And that's what they're trying to prevent. The state of Washington is pretty adamant about cost being allocated to uh, the cost center where the cost was incurred. So, so they won't wait trying to sneak some money out of the water fund to pay for something that should be in the yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. You so, so, so that's the illusion of Councilmember O'Callaghan's comment. The, you know, most appropriate way to fix that is is to really analyze each one of those costs and where we attempt to fund that through the proprietary fund where it's not really appropriate. For example, my salary. Yeah, I do a little bit with respect to sewer and water, but it's just a tiny fraction. Uh, but, but if you do the assessment to, to get all those, then we could develop an additional excise tax that we would charge ourselves to get the money out of the proprietary fund back into the general fund. And that's what they want us to do. Okay, I understand her. Okay, is that it? Uh, I have no report. I attended the, the auditor's exit conference. I held, a, I held a few other meetings, but you've heard all about those. Uh, be that. There's no report. CIP. Uh, meetings next month. Solid Waste. That's next month, too. TCOM. Tonino School Board. I have another question. Thurston. I have a, a comment. Just I want something I saw that I just think is good for the public and the board to know. I saw on Facebook today there's a big uh, brush about uh, the school passed, or, or I don't know if they passed the ordinance or what they did, but they are something that allows transgender transgender oh, students yeah, in yeah. bathrooms. It's, right. a state, it's a state requirement. It's a state requirement. It's a state requirement that all schools adopt this. And, so I just think it's important to know that this was not necessarily the view of the board or the school district. This is something no. that the state is requiring them to do, and I'm sure everybody on the board has their opinions. And Joe, but, came, Joe came on yeah. and explained exactly it why. Big, it was kind of a big deal. I just think it's important for our people. Yeah. High school started it last year. They started the allowing it to happen, and it, it did not work out well. It did not. <laughs> but anyway, I just think it's important for our citizens to know that, where that came from. Yeah. Even though it's not really a city you know, issue, but it's a big well, issue for the city. It's not a school district. It's not either. The district. state said you have yeah. to do it. You know? yeah. I do have something to report. Mm -hmm. I went to the um, Green Ribbon panel meeting, the exit 
meeting, and there was a gentleman there, and I didn't get his name because I got there a little bit late, so I didn't hear his name, and he didn't have a name placard in front, but he has a meat processing, one of the members of the committee. And he, he said he thought it would be very important that the city of Tobino have at least two people on the advisory board. And I, and I thanked them very much for all their work. I was asked um, <laughs> what my vision for the city was, and so mm -hmm. I told them how I felt about it. You know? But yeah, yeah, it was a good meeting. And yeah. of course, anything that Doug Ma uh, facilitates, facilitates is, is informative. He's good. So we'll look forward to a, kind of a final wrap up of that. Yeah. That's uh, the last meeting, right? Yep. Wrap up the wrap. Yeah. Yep. Steady. I actually missed that meeting. Okay. I was there. It was very good. It was out, out at the, um, the casino. The casino. And a uh, good report from the, he, I think he's the CEO of the tribe. Uh, what's his name? Rodney. Rodney's not that. No, Rodney's, no. It's the other guy, the Robert something, I think is his name. Okay. Really, really good report um, from him on the, on the different things that they're doing. Okay. And uh, TPV. Uh, I ended up getting back up on my soapbox again about small cities and how we don't get hardly any money for our roads even though we spend a lot of our money up in North County. We started talking about uh, barely touching on the $30 license tab fees because nobody knows for sure how that's going to happen, what's going to happen with that. And it's every couple of years you just have it up to here. When I get up on my soapbox, this since 1996 when I first took my seat.